Hello, Louis. How's it going? <laughs> not too bad, Stephen. How are you? Yeah, I'm not bad. I'm not bad. It's a bit, a bit weird, isn't it? Coming yeah. together and and, uh, and now that we've had an audio cue to start to start talking, it's a little bit. Yeah, I. I it'll be interesting anyway. It's something different. <laughs> something different. So, um, I suppose we should introduce ourselves first yeah. of all, really. Please. Yeah, I'll go first. off. obviously, I'm Louis. Louis, uh, work at West Coast, where you're. Well, Beckler's distributor for, for Microsoft services. Mm-hmm. Worked very closely together since since Microsoft made CSP business. Um, and then I suppose you, it's time for your introduction, isn't it? Yeah, no. So I have um, I have the amazing job title of technology evangelist for Beckler here in the UK. Um, and my role is... How to, did they come up with that? That's a bit, a bit of a uh, way of a field, isn't it? It, it is. I, 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 people say is that your... Is that, is, is, that that you, is, that, did you, is that your rider? Did you want to be called that? And, and I'll be honest, no, no, it wasn't me. Um, I, I, I have a love-hate relationship with it. Um, I think it's what you get called when um, it's difficult to kind of pigeonhole what you do and how yeah. long you've, you know, you've built that expertise. So um, I've been in IT now for ooh, 22, 23 years. Um, and when we, when, when we joined Beckler as part of a merger... Um, there was somebody who already had my job, if that yeah. makes any sense. <laughs> what do we do, what do, we do, what do, we do with him? Same. Yeah, absolutely. So, so, so it's been it's been evolved out from there. But my role is to meet with clients, understand what they're trying to achieve, understand what technology is coming out, making sure that we're mapping that out. And at the moment, it's just it's every conversation is generative AI. Yeah, completely. Um, a lot of it Microsoft Copilot, um, and that's probably a good place to start. When we say Microsoft Copilot, what what, what are we talking yeah, about at the moment? I suppose, like you said, it's a generative AI is the new buzzword. And you know, I think we was at an event here, and someone said, um, even my milkman's got a generative AI product to help him deliver milk better, <laughs> and, and it does seem that way sometimes. Copilot is just Microsoft's brand of AI products, and I think that's that's the best way of putting it. It isn't one particular thing, is it? And, no. and we both know it's it's ever expanding. I think the, my last count there's twenty three different Copilots, so <laughs> it, it it does get confusing sometimes. And I suppose you you have the same as well. You know, it's which one do I actually need to to put in here? Which one is the the best fit? No, absolutely. I, the the big thing at the moment, the one that most people are referring to when they say Microsoft Copilot, though, is Microsoft Copilot for Microsoft 365. Yeah. Um, bit, of a, bit of a mouthful. Yeah, I, I, you know, it bookended it with Microsoft. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm, I'm no marketing guru, but, you know, Copilot for Microsoft 365. And that that's really the, the version that integrates that generative AI, those large language models. I always struggle with that. LLM. <laughs> LLM. LLM. Uh, ChatGPT4 Turbo. Uh, into Word, Excel, PowerPoint, uh, OneNote. Um. Yeah, and it, I suppose it's ever-expanding as well, isn't it? It's coming into, like you said, OneDrive, SharePoint. No matter where you think about it, it will all, yeah, all be integrated. Yeah, loop, it's, yeah. It's, it's across the board, and it's that Microsoft suite, and then bringing in your own data, isn't it, yeah. from the Microsoft Graph environment. That That's what most people are referring to when we start talking yeah. about, about Copilot. That that seems to be the big the big push anyway. 100% and it is that whole thing of having the ability to use generative AI on your own data, on your corporate data. You don't need to copy and paste from a, a Word document to chat GPT and then copy it back over and be worried about, you know, who can see it and what can see it. It's all within your environment. Well, that's the big thing, isn't it, at the moment? You, you start to see out there um, that concern around the security of it and the efficacy of it. How are we making sure that we're protecting the corporate data? And that's leading to uh, the need for solutions like yeah. Copilot that protect that and, and respect that. But it's it definitely feels, and I think the Work Trend Index said something about this, there's a lag, isn't there, between yeah. people's utilisation and, and where businesses are. So you, 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 what's the stat the other day? Yeah, so it was 75% of modern workers, knowledge workers, actually use generative AI products in their day-to-day work. But only 70, 78% of those modern workers, 78% of those people is bring your own AI. Mm-hmm. So it's not a Microsoft 365 Copilot. It's not a Gemini Copilot. It's not ChatGPT in the paid version. It is something that they are getting off the internet, which is unsolicited, mm-hmm. which opens up business data to be potentially moved outside, be uh, compromised, whatever it is. So it's not 
it's people are willing to use AI and they are using it, even if the, the leaders aren't aren't too sure. And, and we did a webinar recently um, and some of the statistics from that said the same, didn't it? The business leaders are a little bit unsure of where they can use generative AI. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely like, and, and you're seeing that shadow IT is a real a real risk, a real concern at the moment. Um, and and there's, it's interesting where the push has come from. So it tends to be either end user, as we've spoken about, where people have gone, look, this can help me in my everyday work. I can I can be better. I can be quicker. Or be it they might be, not be particularly vocal to their to within the business about yeah. le- leveraging it. Or it's from that that C suite. It's from the the leaders, the business decision makers who've seen the potential and are driving that. And then you've got. I think IT in the middle a little bit at the moment where a lot of a lot of IT departments, a lot of IT directors, CIOs are, are looking at going, how do we make sure that we deliver this, but we've got to do it securely? And there's there's a couple of things I think were early barriers. One I think was around budget. Yeah. That expectation of well, this is coming out of a budget and it's just a pit. So nobody's nobody put nobody put co-pilot expenditure and licensing yeah. in their in their it's budget. It's not like you're turning them. something off either. You're not turning off AWS to put on Azure, you're not turning no. off a SAP system to turn on dynamics. It is a, a new cost that's come out of nowhere. No, absolutely. And you need to have that recognition within the business that it's the productivity gain that you're going to gain out of this um, that's going to pay for it. You know, it's going to pay for itself from being able to do more better and quicker. Yeah. I think there's, there's a little bit of mis- not un- un- misunderstanding or lack of understanding on what that return on investment is. Hmm. What does that productivity time saving look like? What does it look like in, in a real world example? Yeah. And, and that's, and you know, there's studies all the time looking at that. Yeah. I mean, the the, the study I always quote when I'm asked that was actually dates back to September 23. And there was a Harvard Business School yeah. and Boston Consulting Group study. Uh, they took 700 uh, Boston Consulting Group consultants and split them into three different groups. And what they found was that those groups that had access to generative AI tools, I think they were using ChatGPT for, it's his pre-co-pilot, the study was done, had a uh, uplift in um, a quality of between 17 and 43 percent depending on how experienced yeah. and the task they were doing so it's quite considerable and then the time saving they got back you know a task that w- was suitable for ai and there's there's a key thing mm. can, can it do it was 25 percent faster so it's a I big think, yeah big i think impact. you know if you just look at those the, you're not just improving the productivity but the end quality of the work not just saying all right you can say te- save time mm. but actually you can actually be better the end quality of the work is going to look more polished it's going to look more finessed it's going to put you in a better light than than without ai we're using it to augment people not to replace them and i suppose that's another statistic people are worried that an ai will, repl- will replace them but this isn't what it's there for it's you know i it's, it's a bit of a cheesy one but it's called coal pilot it's there to work alongside you it's not automation it won't do it automatically it won't go off and, and it's something that we said earlier you know actually it would be a bit cool if you got an email and automatically drafted a response and so you could go in and edit it but it's not there to do that you have no. to prompt it you have to go in and say right this is what i want to get out of it this is what i want you to do mm. um, and and it will do that for you it won't do it automatically no and 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 i think it really is the case where you start to look at how i'm going to be able to improve the quality of work i mean just simple things like the coaching feature within outlook being able to turn around and go actually i've written this email does it read right yeah Yeah. am i hitting the right prompt and i i had a difficult email to write a couple of weeks back and it and it the the coach said well you're being quite pointed here and actually that was part of that email the the message that needed to to to, oh i wanted to, to convey at that point um but having that look over the shoulder, that reread, that second pair of eyes, where that would have probably previously have been me interrupting a coworker or a colleague and going, you know, Louis, could you just have a look through this? Does this sound right? Have I, you know, am I off, off it? Um, now being able to do that quickly without interrupting something, that, that's got a benefit. Exactly. It's not something that we wouldn't do anyway. I suppose that's the thing. We're not, not doing it anyway. And no. You're just leveraging AI to do it quicker and more efficiently. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think you can see that across a range of tasks. So like within teams, the, the, the summarizing of meeting notes, that's the big one. When you look at that work trend index, they're saying that there's on average something like eight hours worth of meetings. I think it was a month they were saying yeah. it was, or, to, or, or a week was 
automated and, and the notes and the, the action points generated. That's a huge time saving to manually sitting there going, oh, I need to write this out. I think as well, not just that. So yes, you can summarize them, but the ability to be present in a meeting is something that is, you know, probably understated realistically. You're able to be present in the meeting, understand what's being said, understand the context. It has someone said something sarcastically that you've not picked up on that you can then be, you don't have to sit there, all right, writing notes. Oh, sorry, could you just repeat that, please? I'm, I'm not too sure. All right, sorry, I wasn't, I wasn't concentrating. You're able to sit there and be focused on that one person and that one conversation that you're in. Yeah, and, and you know what, that, that kind of then tees into that cultural change that we're going to have to go through with AI because I, I mean, I'm old school. The idea that you'd have a meeting would be in face yeah. and you would have your notepad and your pen and you'd take notes, right? And, and the mere act of you taking notes was a signal that this meeting was important to you and that you were paying attention to it. And, I, and you almost have a generation, I think, or certain certain perceptions well if you're not making notes are you are you really interested <laughs> so are you are, gonna are, hit record yeah, and, that, that's I, your yeah. and, and i think it's understanding that that change is happening has happened i mean it's a bit like uh one of my colleagues for for many years who'd he would take his notes on his phone um and that was problematic he'd have to explain at the start yeah. of the meeting it looks like but no i'm taking notes on my phone fo 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 at least that's what he told us he was probably, <laughs> yeah. he was probably absolutely nailing yeah. sudoku or something like that you know his candy crush scores off the <laughs> off the charts um but it's it that cultural change that ai is signifying that's really important how, how businesses adapt to that i think is going to be really interesting yeah and how it can augment because it's not just as you said, yes, you can you can prompt the AI, but that cultural shift is something different as well. It's about being willing to invest your time. And in the work training, they said that as well, that the power users or the leaders that are utilizing generative AI, not just talking about Copilot, we're talking about all generative AI because every, every generative AI is brand new. It's an unknown. So it's those people that are willing to invest their time in trying new things. You know, prime example, Copilot in Excel, you know, when it first came out, you saw the nice videos and I went in there, I was like, right, create me a table on this. And it, I asked it to do it and it said, oh, sorry, I can't do that. All right, something else in the video was conditional format and do this conditional format. And oh no, sorry, I can't do that. And so you then went in a, a month later and then you asked the question and it would do it and it would create your column or it's an ever evolving, it's an ever changing thing. So even if it doesn't work today, you've got to go in and, and try and use it. Like, for example, I was doing the stuff in Excel, I was extracting data and I, I asked it to do something. I asked it to map out data, do a VLOOKUP from one table to another and input the data. I only went with one column, but then it did three. I was like, ah, oh, that's a bit interesting. Oh, now let me try and get you to do four. So I said, all right, do four. And it did six. I didn't ask it to do six, but it did six. That's when I knew that that was the limit. So it wasn't, it was me testing it, me trying mm. it, but it's that constant willingness to, to attempt things, to try things. Otherwise you're never going to know what you don't know. How do we adopt Copilot within our organizations and, and actually get the benefit quickly um, and reliably moving forward? What, what, what's the keys? Do, have you found out that? I think it's down to training and, and you can't be understated in that training. You know, I always give the example. I was given a Copilot license. You know, one of the first people within our company, my my role is Copilot specialist. So there's that, right? Yeah, he needs a Copilot license out of anyone in the business. <laughs> You'd have been bitter if you hadn't. Yeah, exactly. one, yeah? <laughs> Going out to different customers and partners, doing doing <laughs> podcasts and, and they don't have a license. But so I had it from, from the very first, very first day. And I was sat there and I was like, right, this is cool. This is nice. Well, what what can I do? What what is the art of the possible type type thing? And it is, you know, for when you look at that work trending next, those companies that are willing to invest the time, invest into training for generative AI tools on how to prompt, how to learn, where it can be utilized and, and leveraged, are those that are adapting and utilizing it more and able to find those uh, those time savings mm -hmm. um, and those those efficiency savings. So have you, have you seen the same? Do you believe it's around training? I suppose that, that's my aspect. Yeah, I, I think training is a huge thing. I mean, you... you, you Again, we keep referring back to the Work Trend Index because it's such a fantastic report and, uh, and, and source of information to understand what's happening out yeah. there. And it's updated regularly. And you see the stats that leaders are prioritizing recruiting people with AI skills. I think it was something like two thirds of saying yeah. it's important. Um, yet the number of people that are receiving training on it's really actually quite low and kind of, you know, below 40% yeah. uh, mark. So that definitely i think that's a factor i think there's we're still in this world of well what does ai training look like so at the moment it's it feels pretty primitive in this it's 
guidance on how, yeah. how to prompt and getting an understanding of how it would work. So that, that's a challenge. Um, I think that's a big part of it, sharing that best practices than people are learning. So you see things like prompt body and building a center of excellence within a team's group or having a set of meetings and, and that yeah. helps. What would you say with the center of excellence then is that, do you think that's, that's imperative that you would have that, that collaboration piece and would it be on the original cohort of people that you put the co-pilot licenses on? Why would you say that, how would you expand it? How would you roll it out to an organization? Well, I think the first thing is the cohort of people that you pick. I'm a huge fan of having cross-functional pilot groups. Too often when new technology comes out, it gets given to IT, the, the, the particular specialists yeah. that uh, it, it feels relevant to, and maybe somebody in the C-suite, yeah? So, so we'll give it to all the directors and, and we'll have it in IT and we'll play about with it and see if it's any good before we go any further with it. And I, I actually think that's counterproductive with Copilot and generative AI tools in general, because how you get the most out of them is all about how do you use them day in, day out. And that's all about your business processes and how you operate. And that's different if you're in marketing or HR or sales or logistics or, or, or technical. Those are different yeah. skill sets. And so your use of it's going to be different. And I think if your pilot group that you use is too narrow, you miss potentially, you know, some key savings, some, some, some key learnings there. So I think that's really important. I then think when you start to build that center of excellence, yeah, teams, groups, great, but you need to have um, regular check-ins with people, some, some prompts to share that, that information, those learnings. Um, I think that's really important. So if you start with that group and then bring it and widen it out as you widen out the deployment, I think it's really important because then it becomes a training tool in of itself. Yeah. I know, and we did something similar. I don't know if, if you did uh, Beckler, but we did one person from each department and then we would have weekly syncs where we'd come back, right, what have we seen? And and even those weekly syncs, it's it's about sharing ideas because, it's again, it's about that collaboration piece. But one thing that I use quite a lot is the Microsoft 365 chat and I go in there and it's my personal assistant. I don't know about you, but I'm in meetings day in, day out. And sometimes I'll be out at an in-person event, out at, out at a customer site, whatever it may be. I then got to go back to work the next day or in a couple of hours time and understand that I've got 15 e uh, 50 emails, whatever it may be, however the number is. I've got to then go back to so I've got to then prioritize them. The ability to go in and say, right, what emails have I missed? Is there actually anything that I need to go back to prioritize this for me? Not just that, I was off for a week last week. I, I went to went on holiday and to come back to 250 emails and think <laughs> the daunting task of thinking, right, I'm going to have to go through each one of these individually i could just go to cold pilots and say, right what have i received is anything most important in the past seven days catch me up from my up time away that time saving saved me a probably two hours in the morning maybe even three having to go and manually go through yeah it's those learnings it's that learning that's saying oh i had that action for that meeting and being able to go and ask it well what did i need to do for this uh, for this customer again it's learning that you can do that and making it a habit. That takes time to embed. And I think having those check-ins definitely is really important. It's definitely something that we've done here at Beckler, the, the prompt buddy and, the, uh, and having champions within the organization to be able to kind of share those learnings um, is really important. But you also have to recognize that there is, a, there is a learning curve with this. And the other temptation that you see people jump on is the ability is moving the license too early yeah because it's not a cheap license you know no. i i think it's very good value when you look at the whole return that you get from it but you kind of do this two-week thing i think the first two weeks you got a license you, you hammer it going oh I'll try this or try that and try it. and then you kind of forget it's there because you just go back to your normal working week and then it slowly picks back up you start starts to um, bleed into everything that you do yeah. and i think that process, I think Microsoft says in like 11 weeks. Yeah, so the the 11 by 11. So it's another another mm. statistic that came from Microsoft where they studied a lot of people. Or I think there was 250 people, 300 people that mm. had a call pilot. And they went to them and said, right, how long did it take you to become proficient at it? And it was about 11 weeks. Mm. And the other 11 is if you save 11 minutes a day, people will think, re see that as a return on investment, whether that is in emails, whether that is in summarizing Teams meetings, summarizing Teams messages, whatever it is, around 11 minutes and then that 11, 11 weeks to, to be able to, to utilize it. And again, where it is augmented into your day to day, where it is a, an unconscious thing where you come in and you use Copilot to, to find those different things. And 
I suppose it's not just that. It's because you're delegating out, aren't you? You've got to learn where that AI person comes in. I always make the joke that I've got, I've now got little Jeeves in the corner. I need to know, <laughs> right, Jeeves, come in. And this is this is a job for you, not for me. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's really interesting. You, you, you learn where to, to apply it. And that changes as it evolves. But you learn where to apply it and how to apply it and get the right results. That takes time. Yeah, yeah that takes time. And, and I think that's the 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 other key adoption thing, I think, having the sense of uh, center of excellence, having the training, you know, having a cross-functional co-pilot, but also being realistic on the timescales that are involved. Um, it's not but gonna I, be overnight. Yeah, yeah it's not gonna be overnight. But that said, I don't think I don't think we can really, in if seventy-five percent of people are using AI anyway, and we, you know, the adoption rate for corporate AI is really, really low. That's a worry. So, yeah. so, so from a security point of view, that's the other big holdup you see. The, the cybersecurity conversations going. Like, well, um, we've got all our data in SharePoint, or we haven't, or OneDrive. Yeah. But we've got. Oh, what's the phrase? The phrase, and I love this phrase: is our data is protected by obscurity of location. <laughs> They don't know where it is. <laughs> I, we don't know where it is, and not. And if we don't know, no one else does either, right? That that was that was the the the. And obviously, that's not deliberate. Uh, the deliberate strategy. That's how it's a, how it's accrued, because somebody comes into an organisation, they get set up with permissions, they get access to data, and then they move a team or they leave a team or they. And does that get reviewed? I, I, very rarely and not just that moving on-prem to cloud you know a lot of companies have done that in in the past and just moved it lift and shift right it's the we know it's there but we don't need to access it so we'll just keep it there for record's sake no absolutely once he's in that data yeah and and that and that causes people a lot of concern and yes there's tools things like purview um there's the ability to even exclude certain um sharepoint sites from indexing so you can you can get some advantage of it and i suppose there's an element where We've gone as a, a, a an industry. We've gone. I'm talking about IT de departments. Look, we're going to have to roll this out, but we're going to first need to address the security. Well, <laughs> this is a this is the dilemma. When you look at those statistics, written large, if you're not using a corporate system, where are you putting that data? You know, what are you using AI for? You know, are you taking company data and dropping that in? And that's a real concern. Yeah. So having that. It's almost a case of, well, it might be better just to exclude people from, uh, exclude data from the index whilst we address it. And in the meantime, give people something. Um, that's got to be better than having yeah. nothing. I suppose the, again, like you said, the, the in terms of putting Copilot onto a user and, and allowing them access to, to use generative AI, is as simple as putting a license on. There is nothing else in the background. Mm. The issue around the data is, they've not set the permissions in, in previously. And, and it's not something that's, as you said, because people come and go, job roles change. It's something that's not been kept up with. And, and it is something that should have been. I know that personally what I say is, and what I've seen is we've gone through three different vectors of, of security. We've gone through that identity piece where multi-factor authentication. If you're not in the office, you need to satisfy MFA. Then add that device or your is your device compliant? Can it access our, our data? But then on that third bit around that data governance, you know, mm -hmm. and it's, it's a, it's a laborious, laborious task. We can't, we can't get away from it, but it is, it's always been there. It's not something that, that that's just appeared. It's always been there, but it's been, ah, oh, that doesn't really matter. But with Copilot, because you're able to surface information, I suppose that is the big thing. We're not giving anyone more elevated permissions, but I can simply put into, into Copilot, tell me more about this person and a real world example i was speaking to speaking to a partner and they was testing copilot for internal purposes mm. and they was like right we'll give it to the it people like you said we'll give it to them before everyone else and mm -hmm. we'll see if they can break it see if they can they can get out stuff that they shouldn't be able to said it took them about five minutes to be able to not break it because the pin missions were set in the first place right but they was able to find they asked it about a certain member of staff and it went on to the internal HR folder within SharePoint and it was able to pull through one-to-one -one information mm. so they was able to see all of that confidential information because it wasn't locked down correctly they had that inf the access to that information already just were able to just with they wouldn't one line to go and find it no. yeah, and, and, and that's that obscurity at location thing and and that's you know we'd love to say that uh, say that IT's much further ahead than that but but it's not and and part of that I think as well is is that is that I suppose, cultural view that that's an IT problem, yeah? Who can see that data? That's an IT problem. And it is, 
from the point of view of the permissions. But it isn't IT that's decided, is this information confidential? No. And then made a decision about where to save it. So I think there's definitely an element there where we have to up that maturity about how we look at data and where the responsibilities lie within the business. Uh, is it purely just an IT responsibility? Is this a responsibility that... that data that, governance strategy, isn't it? You know, Everyone's involved. Yeah. How do we save it? Where do we save it? We only retain it for this amount of time. Mm. And then we go on and we, we make sure that that's you know, data steward. One of the main things is it's now become someone's responsibility within a business to make sure that all of these things are kept up to date because there's no point going through a project of, of updating your, your permissions and make sure that everything's correct. Mm. If in two months time it then falls by the wayside, it's not something that we want, want to be doing it continuously it's just something that will carry on um from from the point that you do that data maturity strategy no absolutely and then you start to see where it's get being used you start to see um organizations taking that knowledge and saying well can i plug other systems into it as well can i breed because there's institutional memory there isn't there it, yeah. it contained within all that unstructured flat file data you know that, that i i i probably have i mean i through one stint or the other, I've been around for 20, 22 years in 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 Beckler, prior, previously ACS. I've probably got all of those files. Yeah. Everything that I've ever written. Now, could I remember where that probably, is it relevant? I don't know. But that institutional memory then becomes part of that. So it could potentially be really, really powerful. Um, or I might just be indexing junk. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> keeping, keeping stuff that you don't need. Yeah, absolutely. It's probably got my tax return from like 2017 or something like that in there. But, uh, but no, you that challenge about how you manage that data, how you do that data governance, and then extending it can that is the other conversation I keep having at the moment. Can I get it plugged into wherever I put this data mm. here? And and do you how do you see that going in, in the future? Because it feels like there's some data that isn't in the Microsoft graph that either just won't be because it's in line of business systems. And then there's other data that, that just hasn't gone to the cloud because it's too heavy or it's too sensitive, et cetera. What, what's the future of that? So we've obviously got Copilot Studio, which brings that extensibility and that's what you're talking about. So currently Copilot for Microsoft 365 and, and all the Copilot systems are only looking at your Microsoft graph data, your organizational data, and they work within the 365 applications. With Copilot Studio, it doesn't need to be in there. So with Copilot Studio, we can point it at your Salesforce environment, your Jira environment, wherever the data is, mm. there is a plugin or connector that will you will be able to leverage. So it is coming, I believe on, on the roadmap, it's around June time mm. that we will be able to get see this start starting this extensibility piece. Because like I said, the out of box experience is Microsoft and you know a lot of questions that you get is oh this is good, but um, but you know, is there anything else that we can do? And and it's not just going to be, and even if you look at the other side of that, you've got Copilot for sales, Copilot for service, and Copilot for finance mm. that, are, that are coming out, which are Copilot for Microsoft 365, but they give you a specific plugin that can go into your Salesforce environment, that can go into your data, no matter where it is, if it's in a, if it's in a SAP system or Dynamics 365, and you're able to pull it all into, into the one portal realistically. Do you know, it, it, it's really interesting, powerful, that Copilot Studio, that ability to integrate it into those different systems and pull different data and then take action on it. That's where we get the the, the next great promise, I think, from, from generative AI, which is being able to re-engineer business processes and you can start to build something that's completely, not just using Outlook and Teams more efficiently or creating an, a, a better PowerPoint presentation uh, or just being better at your, your job, but starting to change business models, that becomes possible with those sorts of uh, tool sets. And we kind of see some glimpses of what that could mean. There was the the announcement, I think it was yesterday now, was uh, uh, ChatGPT 4.0. Yeah. Um, and we talk about open AI because it's a good place to look to see what's coming because of that real close relationship Microsoft have. Don't, don't Microsoft own them now? I think. Yeah, they've yeah. got, I think they've got as majority think, share. Yeah, them, so, yeah. With, with, within the, um, the uh, commercial end of it. It's an interesting setup, by the way. If, you, if you're into your legal IT, <laughs> yeah, legal company structures, check out open AI. But, um, but no, you're right. So you will see those features and the, the videos that were showing of, of 4.0 and the ability to do visual reasoning, the ability to do live translation, and then the ability to kind of do that voice conversation, which is had for a little while, but have it quick. Yeah. Um, 
and with humour and intonation. It's like us sat here talking, wasn't it? It was like, I was like constant back I mean, and I'm a deep ball. fake, so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're really, you're you're really chat GPT. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not a real person. <laughs> um, but no, it's, it becomes really, really powerful because you, you sit there and go, well, there was a, there's a video there of, a, essentially, it was chat GPT talking to itself, um, but a customer services scenario. And you start to go, well, hang on a minute. Now I can re-engineer my process. I can do something different. Um, can I have, you know, can I uh, uh, go into that new market where I don't have the language skills because it will do the translation yeah. for me? Um, that becomes really powerful for businesses. And I, I think that's that next wave. So when people talk about, you see that Forrester and IDC and Gartner and people put out statements like, it can, can increase global GDP by, you know, 11% or 14% or whatever figure that, that, that they've, they've kind of calculated. That happens. I don't think that happens from people being able to cope from email that much quicker, which is great. And that, that helps. That comes from, can we completely cha change the way that we do business? Can we do something really disruptive in the market? You know, do we break down real barriers? That's where I think it becomes really exciting. Yeah. Definitely. And that's Studio, isn't it? It's Copilot Studio is the first, the, the first first great tool in yeah. the Europe and AI stack. That's where you start to build that out. What we what we do as an example with Copilot Studio, because you haven't got the same plugins that, that, that will be coming, mm. is we point it at a website mm -hmm. and we tell it to surface the website. And you can literally go in and then you can go into Copilot and say, right, point it at the West Coast Cloud website and tell me who the, the senior business leaders are. And it will call... Uh, comb through that and then pull that information it's exactly the same same thing you're able to surface information even if it's not not in that organization like you said well that's it it's where you start to build i mean chatbots and customer service agents are the are the obvious kind of starting point they've been web-based we're getting video and voice we start to say well actually now it's calls as well but that ability to go in and have that conversation go you know i've ordered some new tires for my car you know can i book the appointment oh it's this i need to shift it to this you know that those sorts of conversations where it can interact with that databases yeah. and those systems that becomes very powerful um, but i think the biggest thing with all of this is is we don't yet know how it's going to change it just feels like the the early days of the world wide web and the internet right so you don't know what's around the corner. yeah well, we who would have thought that we'd be sat here today being able to see ai on when they're on the recording and they can see everything that's going around and, and you was mentioning you look around and then you mention something that's sat on the table that's out of view. Yeah. And it will go, oh yeah, on the table there was an apple and, yeah. a, and a pair of glasses. Yeah. Where did I keep my, I think that was the Google Gemini uh, yeah. uh, 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 launch video the other day. And, and it is that, where did I put that, having it seen it, it becomes really, really powerful. And and it, as I say, it feels like, as a, you're probably too young to remember, to be fair. <laughs> um, but, uh, but it feels very much like the late 90s, early noughties, where there are, potentially a new wave of businesses operating in a new way and it's really going to shake that established order so when you start to look at the uptake shadow it is just the tip of the concern yeah it's the how do i evolve my business how do i make sure i'm keeping abreast of this and delivering that innovation and there is a statistic i think 66 percent of business leaders are worried that they're not uh, taking on AI quick enough mm -hmm. and they're going to be l lacking behind their competitors because the people that are utilizing AI in the correct way like you said maybe not in the emails and the teams that, that's the rudimentary stuff but you know they are at the forefront they are pushing it forward they are pushing it out to the business they're the ones that are going to be there tomorrow they're the ones that are going to stand the test of time no absolutely if, you know it, it's very much that cutting edge and it as I say I, I remember oh, <laughs> go back to 2004 I remember having a conversation uh with uh, uh with a lawyer who was telling me that he couldn't see any benefit to having his email on his on his mobile phone we didn't have <laughs> smartphones back then or they were the, they were new could you know why would I he had he had a lady that printed them out for him yeah so it was his <laughs> his response um so that change now the idea that you wouldn't have your email or your teams and your instant messaging wherever you are just completely alien you know how could you operate in that yeah. way you know how how inefficient is that it's that it's that it's that kind of change again so it, it is a really really exciting time to be involved in it is there is there any personas that you've seen 
co-pilot work well on or you know I, I know that you've done a lot of out of the possibles you've got in there and, and seen those different person personas within within the businesses is there anyone in particular that you've you know you've seen it work well or is it would it be that that it that sales person um or obviously we've already said not the c-suite because they've not got the ability or the time mm. to be able to invest the time to be able to, to test it i think I mean, there's a there's a lots, but the the ones that kind of stand out for me, um, usually bid writers. That that's a really interesting thing where you've got people that are taking documents to have to answer questions that draw on corporate knowledge. How, what is your approach to project management for IT projects, for example? We might get something along those lines into a in a bid to into our public sector team. Whereas traditionally, yes, we'll have some stock answers that we'll edit. We'll have to go and find when we last answered a similar a similar question. Is it a good score in question and kayak? And that takes time. Um, but what Copilot's able to do is you can just put that into Copilot yeah. and say draft me an initial answer and yeah you'll have to amend it and check it and make sure it's legit yeah and it fits um but the time saving to do that and to get a good answer straight off the bat is immense so i think bid writing that anyone in, in, involved in that sort of work uh recruitment where i'm start needing to sort through cvs and data and get an understanding of you know is this a good fit what does this term mean um that that that's a big big area anyone that's got to crunch a lot of data i think is yeah. is, is the um and I, I suppose you know a lot of that we see about generative ai is about generating new content but it's not all about that like you said the two examples there is is finding data surfacing it from from elsewhere or comparing two pieces of data mm. one of the, the the impactful ones that i the examples that i do when i'm doing that de demonstration is i take two cvs mm -hmm. i then take a third job description and i get cold pilot compare the two cvs against this job description organize it into a table when it when it comes out and then give me a recommendation on who I should be interviewing first mm -hmm. and then three questions I should be asking these these uh, these interviewees and you're not generating new content you know that's something that you do already but within a minute and a half I've then got a comparison between the two I've got them scored I've got questions yes I'll still have to go and look at the CV yes I'll still have to do that that manual task that is my task but I'm hell of the way down uh, further down the line than, than I would be well I mean and that's absolutely the case. And, and just the better the prompt you can get, the results yeah. dramatically improve. One of the things that we had when we, you know, back a very, very privileged position to be rolling out 5,000 licenses, you know, we employ about 15,000 people. So it's so a third of the workforce can potentially have co-pilot. You know, I think it's one of the largest deployments, if not the largest in Europe. So it's a great, great time to a project to be, you know, you've involved in even on the periphery. Um, in terms of how you're allocating and picking those licenses and who gets them, we were asked, you know, put a business case forward. Mm. So the first thing that, that, that I did for some of my colleagues is that I took their job description, described the key challenges they actually face from experience having done similar roles, uh, and then asked uh, Copilot to produce a um, prospective uh, business case for them having the license um given the price of gave it the price gave it the um uh asked it for a proper roi calculation and told it the audience now now that prompt with the attendant job description files uh, as an aside that prompt was probably 100 150 200 words it wasn't a short prompt um but the result that we got back from that you know free page brilliant uh, brilliant um uh business case that kind of just save so much time yeah. co-pilot justify why you should have but really really so powerful right in a hundred words to try a thousand a thousand yeah. a thousand and a half it, yeah. yeah and an roi calculation yeah. as well and, it, and and you know we take it for granted that people can do an roi ca calculation or a total cost of ownership that's not a skill that, that that's taught at school right <laughs> <laughs> that's that that isn't covered at the moment so that that's a business school thing that's a, a experience thing making that kind of knowledge and that capability accessible to far more people it's huge yeah. absolutely huge it's that the power it's a great leveler i and i think we'll see that with copilot and generative ai we are raising the productivity bar and the capability bar across the board um and so the value that humans add is is the bit on top uh, um, 
that that's really really yeah. exciting i think that, that's something that i say as well augmenting those best people so mm. they can multiply what they're doing yeah but then those that aren't at the same standard and, and with excel you know we say about power users yeah. and power providers and within word those people that are used to doing creative writing you're able to elevate all of them mm. with 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 generative ai not just cold pilot no it's really it's a really powerful tool so adopting it huge benefits it's building that 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 plan's really really important and i think having the right uh, cohort mix and having the right urgency against it's really important because we can't be from a from an it perspective we can't be in a world where people are bringing their own tools for very long no the risk is too like high. said shadow it is is one of one of the one of the main main things that's not just in generative ai but but all it yeah absolutely absolutely We've covered so much, probably not in the structured order we ought to. We should get Copilot to help yeah. us with that one. Um, Give us that a script. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah. <laughs> I don't mean I could remember a script. No. Um, but no, it's been really, really useful. I'm really looking forward to, to doing this again. And perhaps in a few months' time, we can sit back because it's, it's moving so quick. And then, you know, and like you said, it's moving so quick. One day, one thing happens and then the next day Microsoft don't publish it onto the roadmap and then you've got you've got a new feature that's a, that's available and and I know that they reduce they announced planner co-pilot and that was the 23rd co-pilot that they in, introduced so in two months time we, we might be up to 64 who knows no absolutely so so next time we should should perhaps focus a little bit more on some of those roadmaps yeah. or on whatever that latest tool is and that's yeah. the difficulty with this when when something's moving so fast how do you you know go okay what are we going to talk about next time <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure we'll figure, find, find something oh uh, absolutely absolutely no it's been a real pleasure Lou. Yeah, thank you for your no. time